the Golden Temple in India, one of the most beautiful buildings on earth. For millions of Sikhs like me, this is holy ground. But just over 25 years ago, it was a bloody battlefield. Tanks stormed the complex to capture this man, Jurnal Singh Bindrawale. To some, he was a defender of the Sikh faith. He, he was a great saint and great soldier. To others, he was a militant who terrorized for long enough. He may have started as a saint, but he didn't end as a saint, let me tell you that. It was Indira Gandhi who gave the order to capture Bindranwali and began a chain of events that would lead to thousands of deaths, including her own. Many Sikhs call this their own 9-11. I'm going back to the madness of 1984 to find out why neighbors became enemies and how a sacred shrine became a killing ground. It was like firing at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. This journey will lead me to victims. And heroes. I feel proud that I have saved a one life. And will make me see my own faith in a new way. Jesse? Ten years ago, I was visiting India with my family and we went to the Golden Temple. I was shooting a home movie, but then suddenly was overcome by the beauty and significance of the place. It was a truly spiritual moment. Oh, wow. So overwhelming, I had to stop filming. It may seem strange, but I'd never felt connected to my faith until that point. It was no longer a place I had to visit. It was a place I needed to visit. Violent clashes have broken out. I'm a presenter. I'm not a baptized Sikh, which means that I cut my hair and don't adhere to the religious dress code. But since that visit to the Golden Temple, I've wanted to learn more about the faith I was born into. Sonia Diol is, in fact, a stage name. I was born Jaswinder Kaur Sidhu. But going to a predominantly white school in Birmingham in the 80s, I remember feeling embarrassed by my traditional Punjabi-sounding name. I was more into pop music and fashion than the momentous news stories of the time. And quite a challenge for my mum and dad. <laughs> what was I like as a little girl? Very cute. Very sweet. But a little cheeky as well. Did you remember this one, this picture? This is going to the Gurdwara, I think. Yeah. I mean, Mum, you used to make me wear some really dodgy Indian suits. I can't mm. believe you made me wear that. But we always think if you try to wear English clothes, you might be an English girl. If you put the Indian clothes, suit, yeah. take you to the temple, you might be changed to the... Into an Indian girl. Yes. <laughs> I may not have become quite the traditional Indian girl my mum dreamed of, but as I've got older, I do now take my faith more seriously. And I regularly go to a Sikh temple or Gurdwara. So this is my local place of worship. It's the Soho Road Gurdwara in Birmingham, and it's always busy. Lots of families coming here every day to worship. And the first thing you do when you come into a Sikh temple is to remove your shoes. Sikhs are followers of ten enlightened leaders called gurus. The first, Guru Nanak, taught that there is only one God and that men and women are equal. He stressed the importance of service to the wider community, so each Gurdwara has a free kitchen that anyone can enjoy. I've even seen Irish builders having their lunch break in here. The focus of any Gurdwara is the Holy Scriptures, or Guru Granth Sahib. We believe that this is not a book, but the definitive words of the Gurus. I know I'm biased, but my experience is that Sikhs work hard, often unnoticed, for whatever community they're part of. That's why these scenes from 1984 are so shocking. The whole of the front of it has been knocked out. There's rubble piled everywhere. You can only go into one. Because the Golden Temple is the symbol of Sikhism, millions around the world saw the army action quite simply as an assault on their faith. 
I don't understand why this attack took place and the tragic events that followed afterwards. For me, I think this journey is going to be an emotional one, at times a painful one, and I know it's going to teach me something about my own identity as a Sikh and how I'm going to cope with that. I don't know. For me, this isn't a news assignment, it's a personal journey. And it begins in the Punjab, in the northwest of India. This is where my family are from. And although I've only been here a few times, it feels good to be back. This isn't going to make sense to some people. I was born and brought up in England, and yet I feel such a sense of connection and a real sense of belonging every time I come here. Just looking out, it's a really warm feeling. I'm actually, I feel very blessed to have two cultures that I take so much from. To understand the events of 1984, I need to find out more about the man at the heart of the story, Jarnail Singh Bindranwale. He was born in a violent year, 1947, the year of partition, when the Punjab was divided between India and the new nation of Pakistan. At the age of 13, Jarnail Singh was sent to a religious school in the Punjab countryside and it was there that a dramatic transformation took place. I'm off now to the school to find out why this young boy turned into such a fiery, inspirational leader. The school, called the Dandami Taksal, is a deeply religious place. So I've changed out of my western clothes into a traditional Punjabi outfit. I must admit to feeling rather nervous about being here. This is a strict male-dominated community and they may not approve of a Sikh woman with cut hair like mine. The Taksal is the place to go if you want to become a priest or preacher. The boys have a strict daily regime of prayer, exercise, but most important of all, learning the scriptures by heart. Huh. Sajit Singh Sodi was a teacher at the Taksal when Bindrawale joined in the mid 1960s. Tu si menu dasso Bindrawale ki dujje bachiyan to vakre lagde si thonu. Lagde si. Lagde si. Oh shant rende si ge te bani parde rende si ge jada dujje bachiyan bani jabad parde si ge. Bindrawale was clearly a passionate student whose determination and devotion would mean that in 1977, aged only 30, he would become head of the Taksal. Okay. The boys today have more modest ambitions. The Taksal has posed more questions than given answers. The Bindranwale I heard about was someone who, if he disagreed with your religious views, would at worst just ignore you. We obviously know that there was more to him than that, and I have to find out what it was that changed him. The answer has to lie in the politics of the time. The leading Sikh party were the Akali Dal, who campaigned for greater autonomy for the Punjab. Lined up against them were the Congress party, dominated by Indira Gandhi and her son Sanjay. Congress had always advocated a secular, united India, and the Gandhis feared that the Akali call for greater autonomy in fact meant a separate Sikh religious state. In 1977, Indira Gandhi asked Sanjay to find a way to break the Akali Dal influence in the Punjab. Sanjay looked for someone who could set up a rival faction. Of the list of 20 names he was given, the new leader of the... 
of the list of 20 names he was given, the new leader of the Taxal clearly had the greatest potential. Bindrawale had become well known for urging village Sikhs to abstain from drink and drugs and not cut their hair. His back to Sikh basics campaign touched a nerve and he was baptizing young men and women in their hundreds. My guide to the complicated world of Indian politics is Sir Mark Tully, who for 22 years was the BBC's chief correspondent in India. Throughout 1984, his reports were a lifeline for British Indians, anxious for news. Bindunwale was chosen in part because of his extreme religious views and because it was thought that compared with the rather tired, elderly leaders of the Akali Dal, compromised in various ways, here was a young guy who was, in fact, a devout and practicing Sikh. And it must have been very tempting to him because obviously what the Congress were telling him was, you come along with us and we'll make you the uh, ruler of Punjab in effect, really. So Congress needed someone to sing their tune? Who could, I think, be made to sing their tune might be a better way of putting it, someone who could be groomed. And really it was more to take a stand against the Akalis than to um, uh, sing the Congress tune. Do you think Bindrawale was a natural politician? No, he wasn't really a natural politician. Uh, he was much more a natural, fanatical, religious leader than a natural politician. Mark met Bindrawale on a number of occasions and found him to be an intimidating man. Uh, I remember one thing which happened to me when I was at a press conference and uh, being a bit of a fidgety sort of person, my foot uh, almost, because we were all sitting on the floor, of course, almost touched his sword. And then Bindranwale looked at me, and I really almost thought to myself, God, this sword's going to be used on me for this. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a frightening figure, there's no doubt about that. Bindranwale generates strong feelings. What some saw as frightening, others saw as inspiring. They believed he was merely upholding Sikh rights and fighting heresy. Some even hoped he'd bring about their dream of a Sikh state called Khalistan. But in the early 80s, Bindrawale and his followers were repeatedly accused of intimidating and murdering their opponents. In September 1982, the owner of a newspaper chain critical of Bindrawale was shot dead. Bindrawale was suspected of masterminding the killing and arrested. What happened next was a turning point. Court proceedings began, but then to the surprise of many, he was released without charge. The government had arranged Bindrawale's freedom, believing he was more used to them out of prison, campaigning against the Akali Dal party. He celebrated with a triumphant drive around Delhi. Bindrawale was seen as a hero who had stood up to the government and won. He may have felt that he could now achieve greater support opposing the government than working with them. Mark Tully has his own theory why Bindrawale turned against his Congress allies. During the raid to arrest Bindrawale, the police accidentally or deliberately destroyed his most precious possessions. During the arrest, the police managed to burn every sermon that Bindrawale had ever preached because Bindranwale had a secretary who used to write down every sermon that he preached. And thereafter, Bindranwale would frequently, when attacking the government, say, what can you say about someone who kills your children, his children being his sermons? And this really does seem to have been something which went into him very sharply. In June 1982, Bindrawale and a group of his followers moved into part of the Golden Temple complex. His critics said he wanted sanctuary to avoid another arrest. His supporters that he wished to be close to the spiritual center of his faith. For me, the emotions I feel as I get close to the Golden Temple are hard to describe. There's a strong sense of excitement because it's here that I feel at peace with God. This is the place that makes me feel more connected to my faith than anywhere else in the world. This 
is the Golden Temple, or Darbar Sahib as Sikhs know it. The reason that this place is so special is because there are the Holy Scriptures, the Guru Granth Sahib, and that's where pilgrims pay their respects in their thousands every day. The temple has a doorway on each side. That's to symbolize access to all, even other faiths. One of the first things I always do at the Golden Temple is to recite prayers from the Holy Scriptures. Although I'm surrounded by thousands of pilgrims, nothing distracts me. So how was this peace shattered? How did the 1984 attack happen? In the early 80s, the Punjab was caught in a spiral of violence, provoked mainly, it's alleged, by Bindrawali's supporters stirring up communal hatred in their fight against the Hindu Raj. Sikhs and Hindus desecrated each other's temples. Buses were hijacked and the Hindu passengers separated from Sikhs and then shot. When the police searched for militants, there were often what they termed encounters, but what others called the killings of Sikhs. This merely strengthened Bindrawali's cause. Meanwhile, his status grew. Pilgrims to Amritsar were leaving their offerings at Bindrawali's feet rather than at the Golden Temple. Children were brought to him to be blessed. In November 1983, in a deeply symbolic move, he transferred his headquarters into the Akal Dakht, the center of Sikh political power. As far as the government was concerned, Bindrawali was out of control. Rajiv Gandhi, now the rising star of the Congress party after the death of his brother Sanjay, called for him to be expelled from the Golden Temple. Tell him to come and try, was Bindrawali's reply. It was clear to journalists who visited the Agal Dakht that Bindrawali was getting ready for a fight. The scene was now set for a terrible and final showdown. On the 1st of June, a Sikh officer named Major General Brar arrived in Amritsar to coordinate the army plans to capture Bindrawali. Still hopeful that some sort of settlement could be reached, Indira Gandhi made an appeal on the 2nd of June to the people of the Punjab. Don't shed blood, she said, shed hatred. It failed. The army received the order to proceed. As tanks and troops enclosed the complex, Bra instructed his soldiers not to fire on the Golden Temple or the Agal Dakht without direct orders. A curfew was imposed and all journalists expelled from the city. The operation, codenamed Blue Star, had begun. It's quite clear to me that a siege of the temple has started. General Bra sent his commandos down these steps to start the assault on Bindramale and his men. But they were mown down by gunmen that were hiding on both sides of the walls. He then sent in a second wave of commandos, and this time they were successful. They got down the steps, but they faced fire from not only the buildings around here, but from underground as well. Bindrawali's men suddenly appeared from manhole covers, firing their machine guns and then disappearing into the complex's many underground passages. The army had clearly underestimated their opponents. Gyanni Puran Singh was a priest at the Golden Temple. He and the other priests weren't going to allow 500 years of prayer to be interrupted, not even by a full-scale battle. This makes him a key eyewitness to Operation Blue Star. He was in the Akal Dakht when he saw Bindrawale in action. Bindrawale 
ਜਿਹਦੇ ਪੇ ਪਤਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਮਨੁੱਖ ਨੂੰ ਪੇ ਮੇਰਾ ਕਰਕੇ ਜੋ ਕੁਝ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਉਹ ਸੱਤ ਪੁਰਸ਼ ਸੀ ਕੋਈ ਮਾੜਾ ਕਰਮ ਕਰਨ ਵਾਲੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਉਹ ਡਾਕੂ ਥੋੜੇ ਸਨ ਉਹ ਇਹ ਢਾਏ ਢੇਰੀ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਮਰ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਮੇਰਾ ਕਰਕੇ ਕੱਲੇ ਦੇ ਕਰਕੇ ਪਰ ਉਹਦੇ ਮਨ ਤੇ ਕੋਈ ਅਸਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀ ਰੰਚਕ ਮਾਤਰ ਵੀ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਹੱਸਦੇ ਸਨ With losses mounting and the operation dragging on dangerously, the army faced another problem. An armored personnel carrier sent in to get troops to the Agaldakht was hit by a rocket-propelled grenade. The army had no idea that Bindromale was so well equipped. General Bra decided on a dramatic new plan. He ordered tanks into the complex through this entrance. Hey, this is the place, right? Yes. This is the tank that is the tank that is the tank. ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਪਲੇਨ ਹੋ ਚੁੱਕੀ ਸੀ ਅੱਛਾ ਹਾਂ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਪੱਥਰ ਪੁੱਤਰ ਸਭ ਮਲ ਦਿੱਤੇ ਸਭ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਪਲੇਨ ਹੋਈ ਆਂ ਥਣੀ ਵੱਡੇ ਟੈਂਕ ਇੱਧਰ ਦੀ ਉਤਰਿਆ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਬਖਤਰ ਬੰਦ ਗੱਡੀ ਉਹ ਥਣੀ ਆਈ ਸੀ ਤਾਂ ਟੈਂਕ ਇੱਥੋਂ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਦੇਖਿਓ ਸੀ ਹਾਂ ਜੀ ਹਾਂ ਆਹ ਸਾਰੇ ਉਤਰ ਕੇ ਆਂਦੀ ਆਏ ਥਲੇ ਬਾਕੀ ਫਿਰ ਸਾਰੇ ਚਾਰ ਫੇਰੇ ਸਨ ਇਹ ਤਾਂ ਪਰਮੇਸ਼ਰ ਨੂੰ ਹੀ ਪਤਾ ਹੈ ਦੇ ਬਾਅਦ ਅਸੀਂ ਕਿੱਥੋਂ ਸੋਚਣਾ ਸੀ ਵੀ ਟੈਂਕ ਆਉਣਗੇ ਪਰ ਕਰਮਾ ਚ ਦੀ ਕਾਲ ਤਖਤ ਵਾਸ ਆਲ ਬਟ ਡਿਸਟਰੋਇਡ ਇਨ ਦਾ ਟੈਂਕ ਬੈਰਾਜ It's believed that Bindrawale was shot as he and other militants ran from the front of the building. At the height of the battle there were three hours of hand-to-hand fighting. The battle of the Golden Temple has been hard fought and costly. The government estimated that about 100 soldiers and 200 of Bindrawale's men died during Operation Blue Star. Pindrawale's body was hastily photographed and then cremated with the rest of the dead militants. 2 days after the operation ended, there were still pockets of resistance as Major General Bra discovered as he gave an interview claiming that Pindrawale had received assistance from abroad. From some of the weapons that we've captured, we can see clearly the identification that that the we can clearly establish that these weapons have been obtained from china or pakistan but there's another side to operation blue star it's the story of those caught in the crossfire when the attack happened these men all from the same village were in the temple complex along with their families and hundreds of other pilgrims to celebrate the anniversary of the martyrdom of the temple's founder In the early hours of the 6th of June, these men claim the army stormed their hostel looking for Bindrawale's men. Grenade hit the camera again. Shishe vich di. Shishe vich grenade. Jede je bande samajh lai paye di, oh theek rahe. Jeda banda baitha di ya bachcha di. Oh bachcha di paune 2 saal da. Dud chungda di. Matlab dud chungondi si. Jado dud chungda chungda te oda grenade na sara paat gaya, matha itta gal ut gaya pare. Tade samne. Haan ji, samne bichale baithe sade. ਇੱਕ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਮੰਮੀ ਸੀ ਇੱਕ ਮੇਰੇ ਘਰ ਵਾਲੀ ਸੀ ਇੱਕ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਗੁੱਡੀ ਸੀ ਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਬੰਦਾ ਅੰਮ੍ਰਿਤਸਰ ਜ਼ਿਲ੍ਹੇ ਦਾ ਇਸੇ ਜ਼ਿਲ੍ਹੇ ਦਾ ਸੀ ਉਹ ਚਾਰੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਮਤਲਬ ਮੌਕੇ ਤੇ ਮੌਤ ਹੋ ਗਈ ਆ ਗੋਲੀ ਲੱਗੀ ਆ ਗ੍ਰੇਨੇਡ ਦੇ ਟੁਕੜੇ ਵੱਜੇ ਨੇ ਇੱਧਰ ਇਹ ਵੱਜਿਆ ਆ ਇੱਥੋਂ ਹੀ ਟੁਕੜੇ ਆ ਥੋੜੇ 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 ਟੁਕੜੇ ਆ ਇੱਥੋਂ ਦੇ ਆ ਸਾਰੇ 24 ਰੋਣੇ ਵੱਜੇ ਜੀ ਬੱਚੇ ਦੇ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਖਬਰ ਮਿਲੀ ਸੀ ਆਮੀ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਕਿ ਸੰਗਤ ਨਿਕਲ ਜਾਵੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਕੋਈ ਖਬਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਮਿਲੀ ਸਰ ਖਬਰ ਤਾਂ ਜੇ ਮਤਲਬ ਮਿਲਦੀ ਉਹ ਤਾਂ ਮਰਨ ਨੂੰ ਕਿਹਦਾ ਜੀ ਕਰਦਾ ਵੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਮਰ ਜੀਏ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆਰਮੀ ਵਾਲੇ ਆ ਜਨਰਲ ਬਰਾਡ ਉਹ ਤਾਂ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਟੈਕ ਕਰਨਾ ਪਿਆ ਸੀ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਅੰਦਰ ਅਤਵਾਦੀ ਸੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਤਾਂ ਕੀ ਸੋਚਦੇ ਸੀ ਨਾ ਤਾਂ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਅਸੀਂ ਅਤਵਾਦੀ ਦੇਖਿਆ ਕੋਈ ਨਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਭਿੰਡਰ ਵਾਲਾ ਦੇਖਿਆ ਨਾ ਇਹਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਹੁਣ ਅਸੀਂ ਕੁਝ ਕੀ ਕਹਿ ਸਕਦੇ ਸੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਤਾਂ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਜਾਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਸਿਰ ਬਣੀ ਦੀ ਵੀ ਆਪਦੀ ਜਾਨ ਬਚ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਜਨਤਾ ਦਾ ਨੁਕਸਾਨ ਕਰਿਆ ਇਹ ਕੱਲੇ ਭਿੰਡਰ ਵਾਲੇ ਖਾਤਰ ਫਿਰ ਇੰਨੀ ਪਾਵਲ ਕਦਾ ਤਾਂ ਕੋਈ ਫਾਇਦਾ ਆਸਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਦਿੰਦੀ It's hard to get any accurate figures of how many pilgrims died. Maybe it's better not to know. This has been a hard day talking to the eyewitnesses and picturing the battle in this sacred place. But now I need to hear an account of Operation Blue Star from a very different perspective. I'm waiting for the man who's at the heart of this story, Major General Brar. Because of the controversial decisions he took, he's needed police protection for over 25 years. We've had to keep the details of our meeting secret. 
I've done many interviews in my career, but none have felt quite so personal. First, I want to know how he copes with the constant threats to his life. It doesn't feel good, but what can you do about it? I got a call from my son who was in America some years ago, two years ago, to say that please go on to the net and open up a site. And there, as you open the website, they said, our number one enemy of the Sikhs today is General Kuldeep Singh Brar. There have been six assassination attempts on his life, which have not succeeded, but the seventh one will. So those of you who are in favor of joining in for this, click here. Are you scared? I'm not scared. You must, there must be some fear. You're under constant well, protection. It's, it's, it's in your psychology, it's, it's at the back of your mind, that's about it. The timing of Operation Blue Star outraged many Sikhs. It was launched during an important religious festival. The complex was full of pilgrims like those I met. Many were killed. Why did the army go in at such a sensitive time? The orders given were, please go in as soon as possible because things have gone to a very serious state. Vindran Wale is in total command of the situation. And the longer we allow this to happen, the more difficult it will be later on to curb it. It has nothing to do with any religious sentiments. And the question is that if pilgrims were inside, we lifted the curfew on the third night to allow them to come out, those who wanted to come out. Many came out. But what about the eyewitnesses that said they didn't hear any of the announcements? That's not true. That's not true. I mean, there were loudspeakers blaring away all the time. But the fact is, it's very difficult to uh, distinguish in the middle of the night who's a civilian and who's a militant. The firing is coming and the firing is being returned. And in crossfire, some civilians die and some militants die. It's not easy to uh, differentiate. Why go in when you know there are pilgrims inside? How long do you wait? You wait the next day, we won't be able to go in. But where could Bindrawala have gone if you had pretty much the whole place surrounded? No, no, it was not only a question of having the whole place surrounded. We would get surrounded in the next 24 hours. After all, how long can you keep this away from um, this news from traveling to the hinterland of Punjab? You'd have had thousands and millions of uh, Sikhs with spears, guns, everything rushing to Amritsar, and that would be a very sad situation for a man in uniform. So you went in at that point for the safety of your own army? Not only the safety of our army, we had to accomplish the task. If we don't go in, forget the safety of the army, the task isn't going to get accomplished. But what about your responsibility to make moral decisions? This is the holiest, this is the center oh, of, of the Sikh very sad, faith. I'm very sad to tell you that it was no longer holy and sacrosanct. So if you're saying that uh, morally we should have thought differently, what about those people who were inside? Was there any sanctity left inside the Golden Temple? Where's the morality of the people who were building bunkers in there and storing ammunition? I'm sorry, I have to disagree with you. What do you say to those people who see Bindramwala as a saint, actually not a terrorist? He may have started as a saint, but he didn't end as a saint, let me tell you that. There was nothing saintliness about him at the time of Operation Blue Star. In the chaos of battle, the Golden Temple was hit and the sacred scriptures, the Guru Granth Sahib, were struck by a bullet. The Akal Takht, all but destroyed. Did he accept any responsibility for the damage done? The responsibility is collective for whatever damage did take place. But the point is, the damage could have been much more severe. But the army held back their weapons at that stage. Wasn't Bhindran Wale, and being such a religious man, concerned about the damage that could have been caused to the complex by sticking out and fighting and opening fire from all directions? 25 years on, do you now have any remorse or any regret about what happened? On the actions that I was asked to carry out, I was quite convinced that they were legitimate orders given and they had to be done. The remorse and sorrow is there uh, for those human beings who lost their lives. One feels sorry for them. One doesn't only feel sorry for the innocent people who've lost their lives, but even those who are not innocent who lost their lives, those who were the militants there, because after all, they have families also. And don't ever those who were the militants there, because after all, they have families also. And don't ever think that those who were involved in this operation 
uh, didn't feel remorse or pity or sadness or sorrow. They did for whatever happened. No one likes to kill. No one likes to destroy. No one likes to hurt. What impact has this had on you personally? It is an imp enormous impact. Once you put on your uniform, you have to accept these things. You have to um, accept the fact that there will be ups and there will be downs. But was this a price worth paying? I, I don't know. I really don't know. General Brar is clearly critical of Bindrawale. In fact, I did meet other Sikhs who felt Bindrawale should not have been in the Golden Temple complex in the first place, but they weren't prepared to say that on camera. Bindrawale still has passionate supporters who see him as a martyr and are unhappy with any criticism of their dead leader. Close to the Golden Temple, I came across a bookstall selling all kinds of Bindrawale memorabilia. What does it say on the back of his T-shirt, though? It's written Bindra Wale Babur Shera. How old are you? I'm 18. 18. And is Bindra Wale a hero for you? Yeah. He, he was a great saint and great soldier. How are you connecting with what he says? By reading books, by uh, listening from other people. So, you are I Indian? I'm Indian, yes. Uh, you believe in Mahatma Gandhi? You, you were not you at the time of Mahatma Gandhi, but you say that he is the uh, father of a nation. Why? By listening, by reading books. So same as that. Same with me. As a Sikh boy today, is anyone attacking your faith? Attacking? In, uh, not personally, but uh, in schools people attack. But you personally haven't seen anything yourself? Although Satnam feels a sense of injustice, he's clearly struggling to find any evidence to back it up. I'm encouraged that things have changed a great deal since 1984. Swords of protest in London. The Sikhs show their anger over Amritsar. The assault on the Golden Temple stunned India and the world. In Britain, there were large demonstrations denouncing Mrs. Gandhi. Several effigies of the Indian Prime Minister attracted the full force of the demonstrators' fury. A community that had been almost invisible was suddenly on the streets and making headlines. I have vague memories of seeing these scenes as an 11-year-old. Then they confused me. Now I understand them. In Amritsar, the military action may have ended, but the tragic story of 1984 was far from over. A few weeks after Operation Blue Star, a policeman called Beyond Singh brought his family to the Golden Temple, and he was so shocked by what he saw that he became withdrawn and more devout. The significance of this is that Beyond Singh was Indira Gandhi's personal bodyguard. Beyond Singh had travelled with the Prime Minister around the world and was one of the most trusted members of her security team. But the events of June so outraged him that he began to plan Indira Gandhi's assassination. Although his superiors knew nothing of the plot, they were still nervous about having Sikhs so close to the Prime Minister, so they were moved from her protection team. Mrs Gandhi strongly opposed the change and so Sikh guards remained on duty. Do you now fear for your own personal safety? Well, I've lived with danger all my life, and I think I've had a pretty full life, and uh, it makes no difference whether you die in bed or you die standing up. On the morning of the 31st of October, Indira Gandhi left her home in Delhi to take part in a TV interview. As she walked along the path, she saw Beyant Singh on duty and smiled. He drew his revolver and fired five shots at close range. An accomplice, Satwant Singh, opened fire with a machine gun. Mrs. Gandhi spun round from the impact and crumpled to the floor. We regret to announce the death of the Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi. Beyant Singh was shot dead on the spot and his accomplice, Satwant Singh, wounded. He was later tried and executed. 
I'm confused about Indira Gandhi. It could be argued that Operation Blue Star showed she had little regard for the Sikh faith, and yet she retained her Sikh bodyguards against advice. But at present you hold no political office. You hold... Mark Tully knew Mrs Gandhi well, having interviewed her many times. How did he explain her decision to keep her bodyguards? Well, I think this was uh, Indira Gandhi wanting desperately to show that she was not an enemy of the Sikh community and wanting very much to do whatever she could to calm the thing down again after Operation Blue Star. But can you understand why some people see Indira Gandhi's action as an attack on the Sikh faith? Yes, of course I can understand the deep sorrow, horror of Sikhs. I mean, I know that if someone came and started firing at St Paul's Cathedral in London, I know the way that I would feel. Um, but I do think that also Sikhs should um, uh, realise that mistakes were made on both sides and that there was an, a, a great deal of violence going on, violence done by Bindran Wani's men. In 1948, when Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated, India was stunned. But the fact that the killer was one of their own meant there wasn't a violent reaction from Hindus. But in 84, when the news quickly emerged that Indira Gandhi's killers were Sikh, the world held its breath. How would Hindus now respond? As Mrs. Gandhi lay dead in a Delhi hospital, a married couple called Gurmej Singh and Mahinda Kaur set off by train from the Punjab with their baby daughter to start a new life in Mumbai. They carried with them all their possessions and ambitious hopes for the future. They had no idea that Mrs. Gandhi had been assassinated and were heading straight for trouble. <laughs> After seven hours, the train stopped at a station outside Delhi. Suddenly, a mob surrounded them and surged into the carriage. One Sikh mother in Mahinda's carriage saved her son's life by quickly tying his long hair into plaits so the mob would think that he was a girl. But the mob were not fooled by Mahinda's attempts to hide Gurmej between the seats. They dragged him onto the platform. It's been a difficult time for Mahinda. Since 1984, she's raised her daughter alone. But recently, after a long battle, she's raised her daughter alone. But recently, after a long battle, she received some compensation from the government for Gamej's death. 
and her daughter is now married. At last, joy has come into Mahinda's life. Can you just tell us where we're going? To try and understand how the terrible violence began, I'm with Ashok Vahi, a news photographer based in New Delhi. In 1984, he was at the hospital where Indira Gandhi was taken to get shots of the crowd outside. But then he came across a very different story. Firstly, uh, it was not uh, allowed to go inside the hospital. Then one of the hospital security has come. He knows me. Mm. And he said, hey, listen, you can have a very good picture that uh, some of the sick boys, young boys, are inside the casualty, casualty emergency. I went inside immediately. I made my camera and took wow, 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 one, two shot took. What a shock had discovered was a group of terrified young men beaten and robbed of their turbans. News had got out that Mrs. Gandhi's killers were Sikhs, and a mob was out for revenge. Is that blood on his shirt? Yeah, that is blood. Now you can see their faces. Mm -hmm. See this boy, see their eyes, how they feel. Mm -hmm. If we go out, huge crowd is there, they will be again attacked by public. As the rioting spread across Delhi, a friend who just arrived by train from the Punjab called Ashok and told him to get to the station as soon as possible. What Ashok saw there appalled him. No longer just beating, the mobs were now killing. The picture he took was printed in newspapers around the world. I've, you know, I've just spoken, Ashok, to a woman who lost her husband on a train coming in from Punjab. This, her husband was dragged from the train. Yeah. This could be the train. Yeah. As a Hindu, yeah. seeing all of this happening for the first time in your life. Yeah, that is the first time in my life. How did that make you feel? I feel... And I pray this will not happen again anymore in this country. But then Ashok went from observing the drama to being part of it. On the evening of the 1st of November, a Sikh friend called Narinda Singh Burnala came to Ashok, too terrified to go home. He realized that the only option was to hide his friend in his tiny dark room. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. In the night, we put some newspapers you just put some newspapers for him to sleep on yeah it's very small but whether it is a big or whether it is a small we have to manage we have to save his life so how long did you keep him in this very tiny space for two days did you have any moments where you nearly got caught out yeah it was a one or two time there was a chances when the mob came outside the my office and they are uh, trying to uh, burn a one six shop here what would have happened if somebody had found out? Can be shot that he can be bitten like anything, because of, people are very scared. So standing in this space after 25 years, yeah. how does it make you feel talking about it? I this? feel proud of me that I have saved a one life. I have saved my friend's life. I'm proud of me. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thankfully, Ashok was one of many Hindus whose first thought was to protect Sikh friends and neighbours. The attacks didn't just happen in central Delhi, where Ashok was. The mobs wanted to kill in greater numbers, so they headed to the outskirts of Delhi, areas like Trilokpuri and Mongolpuri. That's where the Sikh communities lived. Almost every family has a story of murder, burning and beating. He was burned alive in the garage along with the car. At their local Gurdwara, I met three men who'd all lost loved ones. Inside is a painting depicting the horrors of the mob violence. The local Sikh community had described their ordeal to a painter and slowly a macabre picture was created. ਇਹ ਦੇਖੋ ਜੀ ਅੱਗ ਲਾਈ ਹੋਈ ਏ ਇਹ ਕੋਈ ਮਤਲਬ ਗੋਲੀ ਨਾਲ ਮਾਰ
ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਮਤਲਬ ਇੱਕ ਜ਼ੁਲਮ ਹੋਇਆ ਹੈ ਮਤਲਬ ਕਿਸੇ ਨੂੰ ਗੱਲੇ ਚ ਟਾਇਰ ਪਾ ਕੇ ਤੇ ਮਾਰਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਹੈ ਕਿਸੇ ਤੇ ਪੈਟਰੋਲ ਛੜਕ ਕੇ ਮਾਰਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਹੈ The men's story is made worse by the fact that they allege that the riots were no disorganized rampage. Jo police si oh ne aake sanu dhamkaya ke ya to tusi apne ghar vich chale jao nahi to fir assi tuhanu marange je tusi ghar chale jaoge te assi tuhadi raksha karange te har banda apne apne ghar par chala gaya us te fir ohna gurudwara saaliya sab to pehle gurudwara saar ke par jis tarah pata lagya bhai ghar vich assi bhar gaya te fir ohna ne apne bande chhad dete kisi har ghar te ke ke 100 kisi 200 kisi 50 banda ਸਮਝੇ ਨਾ ਅਸੀਂ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਹੀ ਕੱਪੜੇ ਪਾ ਕੇ ਜਨਾਨੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਕੱਪੜੇ ਪਾ ਕੇ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਕਿਸੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਵੀ ਜਨਾਨੀਆਂ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਲੁਕਾ ਕੇ ਤੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਘਰੋਂ ਕੱਢਦਾ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਬਾਹਰ ਚਲੇ ਗਏ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਜੋ ਕੁਝ ਹੋਇਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਬੀਬੀਆਂ ਨਾਲ ਉਦਵਾਨ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਸ ਟਾਈਮ ਵਿਧਵਾ ਪ੍ਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਟ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਸਾਰੇ ਅੱਖਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਵੇਖਿਆ ਜੀ ਇਹਨੂੰ ਗੱਲੇ ਚ ਦੀਸ 3 ਮੈਨ ਹੈਡ ਐਨ ਐਕਸਟਰੋਡਨਰੀ ਐਸਕੇਪ ਇਟਸ ਐਸਟੀਮੇਟਿਡ ਥੈਟ ਅਬਾਊਟ 3000 ਸਿਖਸ ਵਰ ਕਿਲਡ ਇਨ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਅਲੋਨ 50000 ਫਲੈਡ ਦ ਸਿਟੀ ਇਟਸ ਚਿਲਿੰਗ ਟੂ ਥਿੰਕ ਥੈਟ ਦ ਵਾਇਲੈਂਸ ਮੇ ਹੈਵ ਬੀਨ ਮੇਡ ਵਰਸ by those that should have protected them the human cost of the barbarity can be found in these block of flats here women who lost husbands and sons were resettled in what's become known as the widow's colony for them what they saw just over 25 years ago is still raw and deeply painful hum to dosti nahi hui hai na bar garib maar kar di in pe de maar diye in pe na maar diya ਉਤਾ ਮਰ ਗਿਆ ਮਰ ਗਰਮ ਮਤ ਤੋਂ ਨਾ ਰਿਆ ਨਾ ਆਪ ਬਤਾਏ ਆਪਕੇ ਪਰਿਵਾਰ ਪਰ ਕੀ ਬੀਤੀ ਗਈ ਕੀ ਹੋਇਆ ਤਾ ਪਰਿਵਾਰ ਮੇਰੇ ਚਾਰ ਲੜਕੇ ਚਾਰ ਲੜਕੂ ਕੋ ਮੇਰੇ ਕੋ ਜਲਾ ਦਿਆ ਮਟੀ ਦਾ ਤੇਲ ਦੁਨੀਆਂ ਕੇ ਕਮਰੇ ਮੇ ਨਿਕਲਤੇ ਰਹੇ ਉਹ ਗੇਰ ਗੇਰ ਕੇ ਜਲਾਤੇ ਰਹੇ ਟਾਇਰ ਵੀ ਲਗਾ ਦਿਆ ਬੀਚ ਮੇ ਦੋਨੋਂ ਕੇ ਔਰ ਆਗ ਲਗਾ ਦੀ हाय मम्मी हाय पापा हाय मम्मी हाय पापा कर रहे और हम उधर रो रहे हैं आपने देखा आपने आंखों से देखा ये वाला लड़का मुंडा बड़ा छोटी से मारा लाठी से ऐसा सो रहे हैं लड़का हमारा दिन भर दिन आपकी जिंदगी आसान होती है कि नहीं जब हम हमारा अंत काल होएगा ना ये दुख तो तभी भूलने वाला बेटा जिंदगी में तो भूलने वाला ही नहीं ये तो नहीं भूल सकते मैं जब रियलाइज इट वाज गोना गेट टफर दिस जर्नी एंड टॉकिंग टू फैमिलीज हु हैव लॉस्ट सेवरल जनरेशंस सन्स हस्बैंड्स ग्रैंडफादर्स एंड ऑल इन द नेम ऑफ रिलीजन इट मेक्स मी फील सिक टू द स्टमक आई वाज जस्ट सिटिंग देयर थिंकिंग For me personally my dad is my rock. I can't imagine my life without a father figure without my dad. I can't imagine my life without my dad. And um and they've lost all their 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 male figures in their family. And that's really hit me more than anything. The tragic events of 1984 haven't been forgotten in Delhi. I've been told of a simple ceremony taking place that marks the year in a practical and moving way. Hello, Sashikal. Harvinda Folka is a lawyer who's devoted most of his career to campaigning for justice for those who've lost relatives in the riots. He's behind a scheme to plant 25,000 trees right across Delhi. this is in memory of those who were killed in 1984 and so that their memory goes into the history they will be remembered for the 100 years when these trees survived and they grew up it feels like a very positive thing that we're doing yes. here harvinder then invited me to plant a tree i knew in whose memory i wanted to dedicate it but well, thanks for letting me do this because i'm doing this for mahinder kaur whose husband was killed on a train and all the other victims that I've met along this journey really for their strength put a special mark on this so that I recognize this and when I come back thank you for allowing me to do that oh you're most welcome one group are trying to take refuge in their temple 
One group had tried to take refuge in their temple. It was set on fire, their bodies dumped in a ditch. I have saved my friend's life. I'm proud of me. Although Harvinder's fight for justice and a proper inquiry into the Delhi violence continues, India today feels a more integrated nation. It even has a Sikh Congress party prime minister. That evening, Sikhs and Hindus come together in a strong show of unity. journey for me so far but what's fantastic about this moment is that it's the festival of Diwali which is the festival of light uh, celebrating the victory of good over evil light over dark all across Delhi people were celebrating with the usual Indian disregard for health and safety This was the first party I came across, and to say that after two days of reflecting on mob violence, it came as a relief would be an understatement. Two families, one Hindu, one Sikh, enjoying the same festival. Politics and religion irrelevant. This is just one street. I don't want to read too much significance into it, but it's hard not to be moved by such a scene. I've returned home to Britain to explore the importance of 84 to Sikhs here and to make some decisions of my own. In Britain, Sikhs watched helplessly as events unfolded in India. They demonstrated in their thousands and welcomed family members who fled the violence. Inderjeet Singh is one of the leaders of the British Sikh community. We protested, we wrote letters, we placed uh, adverts in the daily newspapers. Uh, we did everything we could. It was reacting to the outrage that Sikhs wanted to demonstrate to the world. Mm -hmm. We are a minority. Please look at what's happening to our community. People came from all over the country, placards uh, criticizing the Indian government and drawing attention to the wider world about what was happening. Um, the, um, it, it was a very emotional affair. Over the course of time, what happened to that anger? Has it calmed down? Has it got stronger? Well, none of us can be ang angry for too long. We do calm down, but sometimes the hurt remains. And in India, the, in, uh, in this country, the hurt remained. But Indijit believes that despite the hurt, British Sikhs have moved on and discovered a renewed interest in their faith. Well, the events of 1984 made Sikhs examine their own religion. What is it? Why are we under attack? What are our teachings? You look again more closely at your religion at times like that. And when in looking closer and looking at the world around you, you realize that Sikh values, Sikh teachings have something very positive to offer. Emphasis on human rights and equality of all people, tolerance, real tolerance, respect for other religions. Um, these things are very important in giving a sense of direction to life. So, in a sense, that is something positive that came out of the trauma of 1984. As I near the end of my journey, my head is in a whirl. My questions are now more personal than political. Learning about 1984 has affected me deeply. But what should I do now? Should I be making changes to my life? I'm heading north to meet a young woman who I hope can give me some clarity. 1984 has played a huge part in Ravinda Kaur's life. I find her at the Gatka martial arts class in Doncaster that she runs with her husband. This is that guy in full swing. They wanted to take the anger they felt at the events of 25 years ago 
and channel it into something positive. Gatka is, as much as it is martial, is very spiritual as well. We come from such a rich history, um, it's criminal to almost leave it behind. Bless us with the ability to be able to carry on this martial art. Bless us with the Leading this class is just part of a dramatic change in Ravinda that started when she read an account of the assault on the Golden Temple. I remember coming downstairs, um, looking at my dad and just falling and crying. And he said, you know, what's wrong? And I said, I cannot believe that something of this magnitude has happened with us. Mm. And I'm, you know, here I am, completely lost. I don't have a clue as to who I am. So before you were baptised in 2005, was your hair short? What was it like? My hair wasn't sh short, but it was curly. Um, you know, I didn't have a turban. I didn't, um, you know, I, I didn't dress did you, the way did that you I look did. more like me? Absolutely. And are you more content now? Prior to, to, to 2005, I'd walk with my hunched shoulders, you know, down the street. And I was almost, to be honest, I was just another brown face in the crowd. To me, that's what I was. Now I walk with a presence, mm. and that presence is only there, I can say absolutely most definitely, it's only there because of my turban. I admire Ravinda Kaur for the changes she's made, especially her decision to wear a turban. And I keep thinking of all the people I was told about who were attacked or killed because they wore a turban. I've realised for the first time quite how important it is for a Sikh to be identified as a Sikh. And that's made me question how I look and practise my faith. If I'm honest, I'm a Sikh who's bending the rules to suit herself. I'm avoiding the tougher decisions. And even though I feel guilty, becoming baptised would be a huge challenge. Never being able to cut my hair would be very difficult for me to follow, especially as a woman living in the West doing the job that I do. I don't know whether I will ever get to that point. Who knows? Uh, at the moment, I'm still travelling on that path. I'm not quite there yet. But I've experienced something I never thought would happen. For the first time, I actually feel connected to my full Sikh name. After going on this journey, that's the one significant change that I have really, really felt. I'm so proud of the name that I was given by birth, my proper full Sikh name. And the frustrating part of this is that I can't go back to being just Winder Gorsi, do I have to be Sonia Diol, that, because that's how everybody knows me. But if I could, I would right now change it to just Winder Gorsi, which just makes me feel brilliant inside. As for the events of 1984, the attack on the Golden Temple should never have happened. It was ill thought out and the repercussions were devastating. I used to think 84 was all about politics. Now I think it's about innocent people and the high price they've had to pay. I can never again visit India without feeling the grief and sadness of those I met. It'll always be a beautiful and sacred place, but the bloodstains on the marble have told me a different story, which will be impossible to forget. You can join Sonia Deal on the BBC Asian Network for discussion, music and interviews Friday afternoons from 1.